I can see this going down very easily. Maybe there's a quick show. Maybe I don't get through all the questions. Hello, hello, hello. Welcome back to Exotic Wine Travel and you asked for it today. I am gonna answer your questions while I polish off an entire bottle of wine. I'm a little bit nervous. I haven't tasted, I haven't drank anything for the last 48 hours. I'm a little bit nervous, but uh, I'm doing this for you. It's Friday night here. I got nowhere to be. Kind of reminds me I was in graduate school. I was in chiropractic college and I had a friend in law school at the same time. And I remember one evening we were on ALL Instant Messenger and we didn't have anywhere to be. And I wanted to drink some wine, he wanted to drink some wine. He said, hey, let's just sit here and talk on ALL so we're not drinking by ourselves. So it doesn't feel like we're drinking drinking by yourself. I guess that's what's happening here. I'm not drinking by myself because I have you, right? I chose Salchetto. This is a Vino Nobile di Montepulciano Reserva 2016 because I love Sangiovese. Got my old trusty corkscrew. I gotta make sure I have plenty of water because it's gonna be a long evening. Well, let's give this a go here. Okay, how long is it gonna take for me to fish an entire bottle? We're gonna see. <laughs> Let's get to the question, shall we? Let's start with Enterelli. What varietals or styles are just trendy and which are here to stay? I don't see the indigenous variety kind of trend going anywhere. People are hungry. They're looking for new things to try different kinds of grapes. Styles, I know they for the longest time they said that orange wine, amber wine was a trend. That's been many, many years. I don't see that as a trend or going anywhere. In fact, I see that picking up and becoming more commonly accepted. Let's give this a go. Sangiovese. Oh. Gonna go down really easy. Maybe there's a quick show. Maybe I don't get through all the questions. Chris Sam 043S. What wine trends do you see? Do they vary per country and region? I think it's gonna kind of piggyback off what we just said. I think the orange wine, the amber wine, the macerated wine trend is definitely here to stay. The largest producer in Romania released an orange, uh, organic orange wine, I think under five pounds for the British market, under eight pounds, something like that. So it just shows you everybody's trying to move to that. I mean, countries I've been in with more developed wine cultures, they're looking for a little more acidity, a little more freshness, not as big wines, but you know, there's other countries, for instance, go back to Romania, for instance, the trend there for red wines are big, robust, a lot of oak, you know, back, <laughs> it's, it's kind of like the trend that was back in the, the USA in the 90s, so yes, I think palates vary region to region. I spend a lot of time in Hungary because their wines, especially their whites, are high in acidity, when they go to other countries, they're like, man, there's no acidity in these wines. When you spend a lot of time in Italy, they like the bitterness, that espresso-like bitterness. So, yeah, trends do vary region to region. Good good question, Chris. Oh, good wine. Wow. Vino Nobile di Montepulciano. 2016, very good vintage in Tuscany. Uh, lots of sour cherry. Just round, complex, just a little bit of tan. Just beautiful wine. I can see this going down very easily. Maybe there's a quick show. Maybe I don't get through all the questions. Let's go to my friend that I've met on Clubhouse, Edward Yost. Edward, thanks. You know, it's, it was great to meet you on Clubhouse. Thanks for subscribing to the channel and always checking it out. He says, how do you think wine discussions will evolve on Clubhouse post-pandemic? And will wine conversations stay in Clubhouse or as other platforms adopt similar audio function? You know, I've already seen in just my few months wine discussions change on Clubhouse. At first, when I got on, it was just when Clubhouse was starting to pick up momentum. I still love the platform, so everybody was excited. Everybody was interacting, going to each other's rooms. Now I see that everybody's kind of carved out their own little niche, and they stay in their own kind of own little groups. I think it's a great platform for wine. You can taste wine. I think it's actually better than Zoom, because Zoom, you have to feel the pressure to get dressed up. Some people don't like to be on video. Maybe you want to eat or do something while you're drinking wine. On Clubhouse, people don't need to see that. It's audio only. I'd like to see producers do a lot more tastings on Clubhouse. I think that's better than Zoom. As other pl platforms develop similar audio things, you know, Twitter has the spaces coming up. Facebook, I know, is investing. There was a rumor that Twitter offered to buy Clubhouse. We'll have to see as other audio platforms start to develop. You know, Gary Vaynerchuk said one time, he said, he said, I love Clubhouse, but is it a platform or is it a feature? Sorry for people that normally watching this video, it's because this is a Q&A video. It's going to take a little bit longer, but I'm doing this all for you. For you. All right, let's move on to Edward's second question. Is Davina the best source for a wine quality score? And how does the rating typically compare to wine quality, both qualitative and quantitative? Example, does 4.0 equal 90 to 91 points? 
I am a huge proponent of Vivino. I've been using it for years. I've built up quite a big following on there. If you use Vivino, I'm not on there as Exotic Wine Travel. A lot of people, sommeliers, people in the wine trade poo-poo on Vivino. I actually really love it. I think it really democratizes wine. I Look at I'm subscribed to a lot of the American journals, the, the critics, uh, Robert Parker, Venice, James Suckling, Wine Spectator. But a lot of times I go to Vivino first because not all wines are rated in those publications and chances are you're going to find them on Vivino. I've generally found if there's over 100 ratings and the wine scores on average about 4.2 out of 5, to me that's about a 90 point wine. And I think it's great. There's going to be skewed scores, of course, but for geekier wines, the type of wines that you're drinking and I'm probably drinking, wine geeks are also going to be drinking them too. So I usually generally trust those ratings. Time for another glass. Starting to feel it a little bit here. I haven't drank in a few days, so it's getting to me. Next is my friend Sergio Percy. Met him in person at a lot of trade shows. I know he's in the industry. He said, why, why what was volcanic soil is important? And who's the ultimate champion of this heroic winemaking? Santorini, Etna, or Lanzarote in the Canary Islands? That's in Spain. I'm not in the vineyard all the time, so I'm not gonna give the specifics. I know my friend John Sabo, Master Sommelier, he wrote a book called Volcanic Wines, Salt, Power, and Grit. He's actually gonna write a geeky book about the chemistry of volcanic soils. I can only say from a tasting perspective, or if you want to get techno, an organoleptic per, uh, perspective, I do think that you see the difference more in white wines, especially white wines that are a little bit less on fruit because you have more mineral notes. I'm not getting super excited about the reds growing in all volcanic soil, although there's some exceptions. The champion of this heroic winemaking, I really don't, I think everybody, everybody that undertakes the risky and sometimes the crazy business of producing wine I give them credit for. I am partial to Etna because I think it's pretty magical that it's actually an active volcano. When you're there in the tasting room, you look up and you see Mount Etna smoking. So I always think that's pretty cool. All right, I have a cool question from Bansicle. Which three wines most impress you? What is your preferred grape? I'll tell you which three wines impress me the most. The first wine is one that turned me on to wine. I was backpacking in Europe in 2006 or seven. I can't remember, it was my first time in Europe. I was just starting to get into wine, but I was only tasting supermarket wines back in the States. I remember it going to Luca in Tuscany, Wall City in Tuscany, ordering a liter of just house red. I think it was Sangiovese. And I remember just <laughs> smelling it for about five minutes. My friends all looked at me like I was crazy. And that's the first time I was like, wow, it's, it's amazing that wine can have this kind of aromas, this kind of flavor. So that's wine that impressed me the most in terms of red. That's kind of got me down this path, this little rabbit hole of wines. Let's go to white wines. A couple years ago, I spent a month in Germany visiting all the regions, tasting through all the wines, going to all the producers. And there was a couple of Rieslings there that just absolutely knocked my socks off. I think one of the most memorable wines I had during that month in Germany was the Wittmann uh, Laborn Riesling, made only for a VDP auction. So that wine's a couple hundred euros a bottle, but it was just stellar Riesling. The tension between this mineralness, this, this bright stone white peach flavors, this lemony acidity, the tension, I just, oh, I just never forget that. Let's go to sweet wine. And I think it's the first time that I really had a true, great sweet Tokai. Uh, five Petunios is what I generally prefer. And that's what just got me hooked on the region. It's my favorite region for sweet wines in the world. My preferred grape. I, I love a lot of grapes. But I think I always keep going back to Nebbiolo and Sangiovese, with Sangiovese maybe taking a little bit of an edge. Hence this. I hope it doesn't show too much. You're going to see me. I can already start feeling heat as this episode gets on. I hope I don't get too red in the face. Derek Sia, 41. Matthew, what's your favorite book and movie related to wine? My favorite book is Paul Lukacs is Inventing Wine. It just traces the history of viticulture all the way to Anatolia, the Middle East, around Israel, Iran, Armenia, Georgia, to the Greeks, the Romans, their proliferation of the vine to the modern day. I think for anybody that really wants to know about wine, that's something to check out. My favorite film, Sideways. If they want to drink Merlot, we're drinking Merlot. Oh, no, if anybody orders Merlot, I'm leaving. I am not drinking any fucking Merlot! It's the film that I saw when I was, I remember I was a senior at Michigan State University, and I remember watching that film and thinking, wow, wine is fascinating. I want to know about wine. I can't even count the number of times I've seen it. And I went to Santa Barbara on kind of a sideways pilgrimage to go to all the spots, visit all the producers. That one's easy. For wine's sake, I think that's Ellen Agrigio. What's the wine region that you visited that impressed you the most? I think the region that impressed me the most visually maybe could either be Dalmatia, Croatia, because of its steep slopes, 
or the Duro in Portugal. I was supposed to be in Portugal again this year for the premiere of the Duro wines. I'm so upset that I'm not there, but I think Portugal is just really a tremendous place. I think be, for being intoxicated by the food and wine, it must be Piedmont. If you combine, especially Barolo and Barbaresco, you compare all those steep vineyards with all the magical Piemontesi food, that's what it had to be for food and wine. We have another one here from my good friend Hill in Mexico. It's so funny, when I went to Baja to taste all the wines, I ended up finding this house on Airbnb, and this guy's name says Hill. And I stayed there for a week until I found a place where we could stay for three months. And he said, you know what? I want you to stay here for free for the entire three months. I stayed at his house. He actually became a good friend. He's always messaging me. He's great. He said, which wine or wine house, winery, you found most out of the ordinary in Baja? Uh, Baja does have some pretty incredible wines, some very out of the ordinary wines. Probably, Hill, the most one that's out of the box is Bitchy, a natural wine producer. And you know what? When I first visited there, that was back in 2016, I believe. He just was just starting to make a name for himself, and now he's all over the world. Good for him. I'm, pr I'm happy for him. And thanks, Hill. I hope to see you soon. Okay, let's keep the good times rolling. I had to order some food because I have to absorb uh, some of this wine here. Next, we have two questions from Game Library. I think he is from Slovakia. Uh, because he talks about Slovak wine in these two questions. First, wine similar to Le Ombor Chablis. It's a premier cru in Chablis. And any good value, Gruner, Veltliner, Dry Riesling, Rhone, Chianti, Cabernet Sauvignon. Also, the wine's from Slovakia. I recently discovered your channel. I appreciate all your works. Thank you for trying to communicate with your subscribers. Hey, I, I hope that this video series takes off because I want to do more. La Omor Chablis. Uh, you know, recently I tasted some amazing wines from the Pico Winery in Azores, Portugal. It's the largest cooperative on the island, largest seller. They have this wine, this wine series called the Terroir Volcanico. And because this is volcanic soil, the grapes are high acid, very mineral driven. I think that's something that you, you're really going to like. Gruner Veltliner, high value for money. <laughs> Austrian wines are all high value for money. Check out the cooperative uh, Domain Wachau. Also make good stuff. Dry Riesling, again, any German dry Rieslings. If you're going through for VDP producers, I suggest Urzwein or Erstelager, which means village wine or premier cru versus the Grosses Gewax. Grosses Gewax can get quite expensive. The Urzwein and the Erstelager offer tremendous value. When you're in Germany uh, or you're in Europe, you're looking at these wines being anywhere from 8 to 16 euros. Incredible value for money. From the Rhone, here's a, here's a, here's a hack for Rhone wines. Get, get the basic Cote de Rhone wines from any producer that does Chateauneuf de Pop. Chateauneuf de Pop wines are a little more concentrated, a little bit bigger. So the Cote de Rhone from those producers tend to have a little more concentration, a little more complexity. Chianti. I have an upcoming video on Chianti Classico about best value wines. I think it's the best value for fine wines, maybe in the world, at least where I like to drink from. Cabernet Sauvignon. I still think you can get a lot of great things in Bordeaux, the Cru Bourgeois. Also look at Lebanon. They're, they're blends, but you can get some amazing wines at the $15 price points. Also, the wines from Slovakia. Uh, I like so many producers. Botfriege, uh, Strekov. Organic Winery, Slobodne Vinarstvo, Magula, Zlati Ro. Those are some. There's there's a lot of very good producers. I'm actually quite impressed with the wines of Slovakia. I have to make it back soon. Next, my friend Luciana. I met her in a wine trip in Serbia. Hey, Luciana. I see her on Clubhouse a lot, and she just said, "Oh, this is the best wine teaser video." Because I made just a preview video asking for questions from you. So thank you, Luciana. I appreciate it. Here's a bit, a bit of a geeky question. Bo Vukovic from Serbia. I met him in person plenty of times. Bo, thank you so much for your support. Hi, so my question is about Plavitz Mali. One of your videos, I saw Shireen come in the wine. I believe it was Krigia. Now, this is true Plavitz. What do you consider as Plavitz Mali characteristics, nose profiles, and if you have some time, also Sorianek, a.k.a. Zin from Dalmatia, thank you. For those of you that don't know what Plavitz Mali is, it's it's a Croatian grape. It's the offspring of the original Zinfandel, which is from the Dalmatian coast as well. You gotta think of these are Mediterranean wines, high in alcohol and high in tannins. And that video you were talking about, Bo, was in Dubalkovich. It was for an experimental wine that he's not released yet. Notes profiles, there's two styles of Plavitz. The big kind of overripe style, where you're gonna get a lot of baked notes, a lot of baked, baked red fruits, 
uh, those garig flavors and just a lot of rustic tannins. You have more delicate plavets, which go for strawberry, cherry type flavors, but they start to have some rose petals, some tar, and of course they're still going to have the tannins. I think with plavets, if I could if I could break it down, just think red fruits, basically fresh or stewed and tannins. That's what I'm typically going to associate with plavets. Sirlianic from Dalmatia. My favorite still is probably Stina. But also, I just tasted the Corta Caterina. They just released their Plavitz Molly. I think it's quite good. Next up from Ruben Chia. I love this question. Have you ever had a wine and not know how to describe it because it was bad in parentheses and just lied about it because the producer was seated right opposite you and you didn't want to offend them? Loud. <laughs> yes, uh, that does happen. You know, initially when I first started in the wine industry, it was it was it was a transition between being a hobbyist and you know transitioning it into my profession. So I think I was a little bit more uh, diplomatic and I was just saying everything was nice back then. Nowadays, if producer asks me and I don't like the wine, I always preface it, it's my palate. Because it's my palate, you know, there are people that are going to like those type of wines. And I'll just say what I like, and then there's some things that I don't like. So I always start with a positive before I go into the criticism. If the wine is really, really bad, it's really hard to hide it in my face, and usually the producers know it. <laughs> Shireen was always the toughest because she cannot hide it at all. Sometimes she, I think, feel, I feel like producers were actually... Uh, quite nervous. Another one from Ruben. What's the best and worst wine that you've ever had? The best is subjective. I'll talk about most memorable because that, that's coming in, in, in another question. The worst wine that I've ever had. I've had a lot of terrible wines. You know, a lot of people don't realize in the wine world, if you're a casual consumer, if you're just a casual wine lover, what you're getting in the shop is a curated selection. First, the importer had to like it, and then he had to bring it to the distributor and the shop owner, and then they had to approve to put it on the shelf. So actually, you're, what you see on the shelf is really a small percentage of all the wines made around the world. There's a lot of really, really bad wines. I remember I was in uh, North Macedonia, which they do make some really, really nice wines, but there was a producer that just made these wines that I just didn't like. And he asked me, he said, on the scale of one to 10, where am I in terms of world, uh, world, world class quality? And uh, that was a tough one. <laughs> but I think some of, the, some of the worst wines I've had are most definitely homemade wines. You know, casual hobbyist winemakers are just making wine from themselves. It's just to drink and just to get drunk. It's not really for commercial consumption. There's a lot of those in the world. Even, even in the well-known countries like France, Italy, Spain, Portugal. Next from the Rootmeister. I really love that screen name. What really got you into wine in the first place? Thank you for the question, by the way. When I grew up, my parents were churchgoers. I'm not, I'm not a churchgoer now, I'm not re religious now, but I got excited for communion because even though it was fake wine, I would drink it. It was so tangy and delicious, I was hooked at instant. But what really got me into wine, a couple things. I mentioned it earlier, the film Sideways. I saw it in the theater when I was in, was I was senior at Michigan State. I thought, wow, this is fascinating. The world wine is stellar. And then secondly, when I went to Tuscany, I mentioned that earlier, when I went to the walled city in Lucca and tasted this amazing Sangiovese, that really completely just rocked my world and I've been hooked on wine ever since. And then I was in graduate school. I had friends who had a hot tub. Uh, there was, it was a house full of all women, all girls that were just my friends. We go over there all the time, talk philosophy, life, just drink wine in the hot tub. And I think that really cultivated my love for wine. I had to take a little break to eat some food. Need to hydrate too. <laughs> Let's move on. <coughs> Bastiano Balaric. Which region of Slovenia is your favorite? Which wine blew your mind? I'm assuming you're talking about Slovenian wine. There are so many amazing regions in Slovenia. I think the one that really captures my heart is uh, Vipava. I love Gariska Berda as well, but Vipava, there's just something special. It's kind of this corridor that, co that connects uh, Central to Eastern Europe and of all the wine districts in Slovenia it's actually the second largest in terms of vineyards in terms of vineyard coverage You wouldn't guess it because when you're driving through the valley You don't see the vineyards, but they're all hidden just like the producers. They're all hidden up in the mountains And I think that's what's really cool The Slovenian mind that blew my mind. I've had so many Slovenian wines that blow my mind I think to Movius Poro or Lunar. I think to Mlelchnik some of his Robola or Anna Cuvée blends I think of Junk some of her wines I think of Batic and his, his Angle uh, Cuvées, both red and white. There are so many excellent wines in Slovenia. I couldn't just pin it down to just one. Brian Bronco says, mineral-driven whites that you enjoy, similar to Chablis, Gros Givox, Dry Riesling, but not as pricey. I think Gros Givox Rieslings are incredible. Uh, I, I think you also should maybe 
I talked about earlier, go down to Erstelager or Ortswein, uh, village level or premier crew instead of Grosses Gavax, which is Grand Crew. Get a lot of value there. Sometimes Grosses Gavax are not the easiest to drink when they're so young. And then Dry Tokai. There are some excellent producers. Formant is a grape that, that is capable of producing some excellent wines. Not all Dry Tokai are good, but in the hands of the right producer. When you think of Demeter Zoltan, you think of Sepshi, you think of Royal Tokai, they make some good stuff. Oremus, owned by the Vega Sicilia Company. And then my favorite is Urgebet Pince, as well as a slew of others. I don't think you can go wrong. I think I'm down to my last glass here. Okay, that's a big glass, but that's the bottle. Okay, next up, Linda Rakos. I have to say, Linda is a hardcore supporter of the channel of our work. Whatever wines we recommend that looks interesting, she buys them right away. She's always always commenting. She's she's one of our patrons on her Patreon account. I'll put that link there. She supports us 150%. Linda, thank you so much. She says, I finally thought of a question for your crazy video. We want to know when you'll be able to visit your followers' friends here in the U.S. Linda, I would like to drink with you and come visit you. I do have some friends in Florida. Uh, I, I'm just a little nervous. Once I go to the U.S., am I going to be able to get out? So maybe once the once the world starts to clear up, maybe late 2021, late 2022. I can't make any promises, but I do want to drink with you and Chuck. Les Paul Guy 59. What was a wine you hated earlier in your wine life that you can't get enough of now? Can be specific. Variety, style, winemaking, technique, etc. Les Paul Guy, thanks for all your comments, everything like that. I, I, I see what you're doing. For me, it's easy. When I started drinking wine, I started drinking serious reds because that's serious wine. Even when I started traveling around the world, I wasn't paying attention much to whites at all, fresh or barrel aged. Now, I actually think I might prefer, in terms of my palate, my evolution, I actually might prefer whites over reds. I think there's a, an incredible amount of diversity. The wines are often undervalued, get serious complexity, and serious whites can age beautifully. And fresh whites offer so much immediate drinking pleasure. You know, some whites that I've really been impressed with lately, Sauvignon, I was there a couple years ago, and the Loire. In France, uh, I keep talking about Riesling from Germany, underpriced wines. And though I've liked Italian whites for years, I'm really getting into some of the crazy grapes. I think it's awesome even if you make them in a fresh style. They're still unique. They're still delicious. Matthew Horton, he's a follower on Vivino, always commenting on my account and Facebook and YouTube as well. Matthew says, what are your top three favorite native Hungarian grape varieties? So Matthew is Hungarian of ethnically Hungarian. You know, he knows that I love Hungarian wines. I have a lot of favorite Hungarian grape varieties. When you talk about pure Hungarian wine grapes, I think when you think of white, Harsh Levelu is my favorite. Even over Foreman, Harsh Levelu wines have a little bit of spiciness, they'll perfume some floral notes, and they're a little bit softer, more generous than Formants, which can be sharp and quite hard. For reds, I love the grape Fekete Yardavan. <laughs> I think only I think only Gary Attila has it, but it acts kind of like a Syrah mixed with a Fatesca Negra from Romania. Those have that that grape has kind of incense, but yet Syrah, you get the blackberries, the floral notes. I'd like to see more producers doing that. And then for number three, I love Kadarka. Kadarka, you know, it's from that area. Some say maybe it's from the Balkan region around Montenegro, Serbia, but Hungary has kind of claimed it as its own. I love in Hungary, you can get so many amazing, delicious, food-friendly Kadarkas for next to nothing. I'm talking five to 10 euros. You're gonna drink some excellent Kadarkas in the country. Nikki G, thanks for following the channel. I know you're in Korea. He says, I'm a huge Red Roan fan. I want to explore good winemakers. My price is usually 20 pounds to 60 pounds a bottle. Any direction, winemakers will help. Thank you. And Nikki, if you're in the 20 to 60 pounds a bottle in the Southern Rhone, you can get pretty much anything. You know, even great Chef Nuff to Pops. We're talking about 30 to 40, maybe 50 uh, US dollars. So, you know what, that's like 25 to 40 pounds a bottle. If you're looking for even more immediate value, I would think of some of the crews that are lesser known on the Rhone, especially the Southern Rhone, like Karan, I really like. Lirak, I love a lot. Gigandas Vakiras, also very, very well known. And don't forget Crow's Hermitage. Uh, those wines can be just outstanding, 100% Syrah. Charles, he's an importer of Hungarian wines, asking a little bit of a cheeky question. Where's Shireen been? And are the two of you romantically involved? Or have you ever been? Let's save this question for the fourth glass. <laughs> well, I guess that question is for the end of the bottle, actually. You know, when Shireen and I, when we started this journey, we were together. Or yes, we were together romantically. Now we're just partners in exotic wine travel. But does it, we're still good friends. You don't have to feel bad for us. She will be in upcoming episodes. She won't be in a lot of the videos, but she'll make some guest appearances from time to time. And thanks, Charles. I'll see you around on Clubhouse. Sushi Nuestro de Cada Dia. 
So it's su- new sushi 10 days. Is that, is, that might be the translation in Spanish, I'm guessing. He said, I want to know what the best wine is for salmon sushi. <laughs> uh, for me, when I have salmon sushi, Blanc de Blanc champagne. That's, that's what I want to drink. Or maybe a crisp rosé from the south of France. Not Provence. I'll go to the other side of Lengua at Corbier. Corbier makes fantastic rosés at a fraction of the price of Provence. Jeff Crandall asks, where what wine is next on your list? Well, Jeff, before the world shut down, I actually had won a contest and I won a VIP week in Bordeaux, which I was looking forward to. I love the wines of Bordeaux, although I don't drink them as often as I want to. And once the world clears up, I hope I can reclaim that prize because I want to go there. Even though I love Bordeaux, I've tasted a lot of the big names. I don't know it professionally as well as some other regions. And I was really looking forward to taking a deep dive into the region. I love both white and red Bordeaux and sweet Bordeaux, Sauter and Barsac. That's what I'm hoping is next on my list. Next up, we have Sienna, uh, who I've met on Clubhouse. Sienna has two questions. What's your all-time favorite red? I know a lot of wine people, a lot of wine lovers say, oh, I can't say it's my favorite red. Depends on my mood, depends on the food I'm eating, all that kind of stuff. I can t- I can tell you as you get more and more into wine, that rings true. I used to think that was so cheesy. I can tell you what my most memorable red is. My most memorable red is a Jean-Louis Chave Red Hermitage from the Northern Rhone in France. Had it with some bottled age the first time I had it. I just smelled it forever. The leather, the peppery notes, I just... I just didn't know. It was just so mind-blowing that a red wine could smell like that. To me, that's still the red wine that's just burning and sticks in my mind. And then she says with a laughy face, what's the most overrated wine? I think that's all subjective. You know, it really depends on, on people's budget price budgets because I, I still think in the... You, you can get fantastic wines, especially when you're in Europe, under 10 euros. When you're in U.S., other markets may... And I don't know the U.K. market, but in the U.S., if you're in the 20 to $40 range, you can get almost, you can get some of the greatest wines in the world. So, you know, I, I generally, even before when I was a prosumer, I didn't like to spend over maybe over 75 to $100 a bottle, and that was on rare occasions because I think you can have so much value under that. Overrated, this is a controversial statement. I actually think, I've always thought this, the genre that's most overrated for me is white burgundy. Sorry, sorry, no, I'm going to get killed by that. I'm going to get killed by all these people. But uh, I think there's great Chardonnay made all around the world that, that, that can compete in quality with white burgundy. So that's my two cents. Okay, getting towards the end here. Next is Vino.co, my friend Sasho Pop. He said, hey, Matthew, you've tasted a lot over the years. What would you say is a magical price for high-quality wine that is fair regarding all the costs? And above that price is mostly marketing, storytelling, and scarcity. So it depends on where you are, Sasho. I, th- I mean, Asia, the wines are going to be priced a little bit more extravagantly. If you're in Europe, I think when you go up to 20 euros, you're getting a heck of a lot of wine. You know, 20 to 25 euros, I think you can drink just outstanding in Europe. In the U.S., it's a little bit different. It's a little bit more expensive. But I still think in that 20, maybe maybe 30 to 50, you know, 20 to 40, 30 to 50 U.S. dollar range, I think you can just get the best of the best around the world as, as long as you know where to buy from. You know, above that price is mostly marketing, storytelling, and scarcity. One of my, one guy that I really look up to in the U.S., Obon Clement, Jim Clendenin in Santa Barbara County, makes excellent wines. And he always thought, you know, Really good fine wine needs to be expensive, but not too expensive. And I like his model. His most ex- He makes great California wine, Chardonnay Pinot Noir, at $20, which for California wine is exceptional price. And I think his most expensive Pinot Noir Chardonnays are in the 50 to 50 to 55 US dollar range. So I like his philosophy a lot. Next up is Nick Stock. What are your goals in the wine industry? Where, where do you want to be and what do you want to be doing in five to 10 years? When I started this, I was just excited. I was naive. I didn't really know how the industry worked. I just know that I love wine. So at first it was just all cool. Now I'm doing this five time. Now I, <laughs> no, five time. Now I'm doing this full time in five to 10 years. I'm hoping a lot before five years that this becomes the biggest wine YouTube channel. I know right now currently Wine King is, this is the biggest YouTube channel, but that's my dream for this. I've been plugging away at this YouTube channel for, for six years now. Uh, <laughs> I feel like I'm just actually starting to learn what actually works to a certain extent. And I'm hoping in the next year that I start to really explode. So thank you for asking me. That's 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 the goal here. The last question, the taste athlete asks, conventional wines versus biodynamic or natural wines. Do you have a style you prefer and why? When I first started really getting into wine, I was all about hardcore biodynamic natural wines. 
And now I just want good wines. I do like some of those, I do like funky styles sometimes, but there are some excellent biodynamic or natural wines that are made in the quote unquote conventional style. I know some producers hate that term. They want to get rid of that and they say, let's just talk about wine quality. I like good wine quality and it's regardless of style. For me, it's all about texture, harmony, and feeling. When you put it in your mouth and it gives you pleasure and it dances in the palate, that's when I think, that's when a wine really grabs me. And that's the style that I prefer. And I love exploring. That's why I'm doing this. I'm trying to explore wine. I'm trying to share it with you. Great question. My last sip here. Oh. That's it. Whole bottle of wine answering your questions. It took a couple hours. It took me to order some food <laughs> to kind of soak that up. Let me know if you like this video. If it's a complete bomb, then maybe I'll only do it occasionally. If people really start liking it, maybe I'll do it more often. So I appreciate all of you for supporting the channel, everything else related to exotic wine travel. That's why I do what I do, and I'll see you in the next episode.